Um, my name is Brian Micklethwaite. I work at the Alternative Bookshop and for the Libertarian Alliance. Uh, these gentlemen here, um, one of them is the first speaker, the other three will later on in the morning be uh, responding to what the first speaker has said. That, that's who those people are and I'll be introducing um, the other three, so to speak, later on. Um, the main speaker to begin with uh, is Dr. Norman Barry, or as he now is, Professor Norman Barry, um, Professor of Politics. Uh, I think there's, that some idea is getting around that he's the Professor of uh, political of, of uh, philosophy, some sort of philosophy, but I'm afraid this is not quite true. He's a professor of politics at the University of Buckingham, um, which, for those of you not familiar with the British academic scene, is a somewhat interesting university because it's, it's the first um, uh, post-statist university, you might say, in Britain. Um, it has all kinds of intellectual problems of, of people who haven't really quite taken in that that's what it is. But um, I'm sure we can um, rely on uh, Professor Barry to change that atmosphere, as we will be hearing today. Now, just another correction I'd like to make is that in the written notes, um, one of uh, Norman's publications is incorrectly described. Um, it's, it is said to be the political and social philosophy of F.A. Hayek. That's wrong. It's the political and economic philosophy of Hayek. No, that's wrong as well. That's it's wrong as well. What is the correct one? It doesn't matter. It's the social and economic philosophy of Hayek. The social and economic philosophy of Hayek is the correct title. And without any further um, confusions, may I hand over to, Dr. Norm to Professor Barry. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I knew libertarians were gluttons for truth, but I didn't think you went as far as correcting uh, errors this late in the day. It doesn't matter about the title at all. I want to talk this morning about uh, an issue that uh, does concern uh, libertarians, and that is the question of the foundations of their doctrine, basically the philosophical foundations of libertarianism or classical liberalism. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'll... Uh is that better? Okay. Right. Uh, I would wish to talk this morning about the philosophical foundations of classical liberalism and libertarianism. I'm sure we're all aware of the distinction between the two, so I won't labor that. What I'm concerned to do is try and look at some of the differing foundations that have been given to uh, various doctrines of liberty. And a particular aspect of the foundations that's important is I think the concept of nature and human nature because all political philosophers are concerned with trying to establish a consistency between their normative doctrines and some view of man. This despite the depredations suffered by naturalistic philosophers from positivists this century. It is said that because of the promiscuity of the concept of nature which, fidget, which affixes herself permanently to no one doctrine, realists and skeptics deny that nature therefore, ha therefore has anything to do with normative values. I myself think, however, that a coherent political theory must reflect certain views about the person, about autonomy and rationality, even if we can't agree on some one unique doctrine of human nature. For example, one common complaint against Robert Nozick's right-based theory of the minimal state is that since there is no sustained attempt to derive a compelling naturalistic foundation for those rights, there is no reason why one should accept the substantive conclusions of his reasoning, despite its undoubted ingenuity. Furthermore, neither such ingenuity nor the extended use of the, concept of universal, of the criterion of universal, universalizability have proved sufficient to save theories of ethics and politics from the charge that they evade the fundamental issues of man and society. Now, uh, liberals are themselves concerned about the paucity of their doctrines of human nature. So I want to really to look at what they have done about this particular problem. However, I want to make an initial distinction between two sorts of uh, liberalism, one that makes little use human nature and one that makes considerable use. One I will call the deontological view and the other what we call a teleological view. 
Now, the Kantian or deontological case of freedom rests upon there being simply side constraints on what one person may do to another. This is Nozick's view. Irrespective of your view of the person, there are certain things you cannot do to people. To quote Nozick, political philosophy is concerned only with certain ways that persons may not use others, primarily physically aggressing against them. A specific side constraint upon action towards others expresses the fact that others may not be used in the specific ways that the side constraints exclude. Now, this lack of dependence on a particular concept of the person that a Kantian liberalism has is illustrated very well by the fact that Nozick himself argues that such side constraints limit what we may do to non-humans, i.e. animals. Nozick shows, for example, an intellectually persuasive and I think morally quite uplifting passage that such considerations, i.e. side constraints, should govern the way we treat animals. We should not do certain things to animals. In other words, liberalism, in his view, does not limit itself to the protection of human interests. Now, many libertarians do not regard that there are such side constraints on where we treat animals because... You can't hear. You can't hear. Slow down a little bit. Okay. It's the echo. Um, I just try it like that. We'll, we'll just try it like try this. It. I'm trying it like this. Is that better? Better? Okay, I'll carry on. Now, what I have called the purely side constraints approach is fairly rare in the history of liberal thought. Rights-based classical liberalism of the un kind has normally depended on some concept of nature, if only to establish the identity of those whom the doctrine classifies as persons, i.e., quite often to exclude animals from having rights. Moreover, the more common liberal tradition is not even a rights-based one at all, but is utilitarian, in which rights play only a secondary or at best derivative role. In its purely ethical considerations, the utilitarian are more concerned with certain sorts of values that we attach to what they call natural social processes. Now, utilitarianism, by dispensing with notions of rights, still has some notion of the person but that, person derive, that, that notion of the person derives from its understanding of s human, social, spontaneous processes. And the concept of nature in utilitarianism relates to natural social processes rather than rights that accrue to natural entities called humans. Now, the first of the utilitarian natural processes I wish to discuss derives from Hume, Adam Smith, and, in the 20th century, F.A. von Hayek. Of course, the idea that there are natural processes in society predates Hume and goes back to Mandeville's fable of the bees, where he explains how vice does, in fact, through natural processes, produce accidental benefits for society. Now, the use of the word nature in this utilitarian view is best explained by contrasting it with the word convention. Now, we sometimes think of laws, states, institutions as being conventional because they could be altered by man. They aren't natural like the weather. We think of natural phenomena as being, indeed, things which are unalterable, like the rocks, the movement of the oceans the movement of the planets. These are unalterable. What certain sorts of naturalistic libertarians want to do is to find a kind of a, a third way or a third world of processes which could include laws and economies. Now, these are not natural, like the weather, because they do come from men's actions, but they're not conventional either, that is, alterable at will. 
In other words, if we consider a society to be a natural process, we think of it as emerging when individuals are left to spontaneously generate those institutions which, in a utilitarian sense, prove to be valuable. And here, classical liberalism derives, derives from natural social processes rather than from natural rights of individuals. Now, uh, if we go back to the history uh, of the subject, of course, we'll find uh, Hume Smith as being the main thinkers in this particular uh, social philosophy. But before I say something about uh, Smith, uh, Hume and Smith, I'll just simply contrast this view of nature with a more radical, perhaps revolutionary one, where libertarianism is derived from certain concepts of the person. Obviously, in the case of Locke, we have a natural rights uh, philosophy whereby limitations on the state are derived not from an inquiry into the benefits of spontaneous social process so much as from an inquiry into rights that men have either by God or by nature. And this goes right through to the 20th century too with 20th century libertarian rights theorists. But also, there's a slightly uh, underworld, and certainly in the common intellectual world, less known view of natural man, which undermines, uh, which underlays, I should say undermines, underlays uh, classical liberal philosophy. And this is a kind of Aristotelianism, which we find in Ayn Rand, and to some extent in Rothbard, in which a concept of the person is so structured that it will be to deprive him of his personality to make him an instrument for the ends of uh, society or the, especially the state. This is a natural rights view, but it derives not from God or reason so much, although it does derive from reason, but it derives from a certain Aristotelian conception of self-development. Capitalism is the only doctrine consistent with man's self-development. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. I want first to discuss in some detail the naturalistic view of liber classical liberalism which bases its arguments on spontaneous social processes. It's important to stress this aspect as being anti-rationalistic, i.e. reason isn't used very much to construct desirable social systems, but natural spontaneity is left to take its course. This contrasts with all of the rights view which do indeed use reason in a positive, substantive sense, to construct classical liberal doctrines. Let's first look then at the example of David Hume as a theorist of natural processes. Uh, Hume was concerned to stress the irrelevance of reason for the determination of our values. Hume's argument for the subjective nature of morality is well known. Morality is a matter of feelings and emotions. It is these that move us to action, not reason. Reason is limited to the manipulation of analytic truths and the cool evaluation of empirical data. The ends that men ought to pursue are entirely a product of their subjective decisions. In a very famous quotation, Hume once said, it is not contrary to reason to prefer the destruction of the world to the scratching of my finger. Now, if all our moral and critical judgments un rest ultimately on sentiment, how on earth can you construct any kind of political philosophy at all? And indeed, the amazing thing about Hume is that while accepting that morality and politics are subjective, he nevertheless constructed quite a systematic and quite a convincing classical liberal doctrine, sometimes taken to be conservative, but in, I think in, in many ways it contains the basic elements of classical liberalism. While also saying that we can't derive values from nature, Hume nevertheless does construct his liberalism on some doctrine of human nature, which I'll briefly explain. Which I'll briefly explain. He regarded the nature of man as more or less unchanging, and argued that plans of government that presuppose a great reformation in the manners of mankind are plainly imaginary and argued that all our ethical and political rules must be founded on the fact that men cannot change their natures. All they can do is change their situation and render the observance of justice the immediate interest of some particular person. 
You can't change people's attitudes or opinions or natures. You can simply alter institutions in which their unchanging natures are allowed to operate. What Hume wants to show, then, is that a proper understanding of manity is, and not some chimerical notion of manity might be, must lie at the heart of correct social theory. What are these facts, then, on which Hume wants to found a correct, and as I think I shall be able to show, a liberal theory? What are these facts? First, men show a natural partiality to their own interests. This is not a statement of a Hobbesian egoism, which would imply that the natural world is a war of all against all, out of which men can only escape by reason and artifice, but merely an empirical statement to the effect that while men have a capacity for benevolence, that's too weak a sentiment on which to found a social order. The second universally true feature of man that Hume locates is the fact that men have a tendency to promote their present to their more remote interests. They're likely to be blind as to the value of the future. They discount the future very highly. Thus, one passion might direct them to their long-term interests, others will quickly divert it to immediate satisfactions. And Hume, with this argument, was to show how a state could be justified to produce public goods, which are of long-term benefit, which would not be produced by private individuals. Thirdly, a universally true fact of man and society is scarcity. It never changes. And because of scarcity, there must be always some property laws to, lay, to locate entitlements to this or that. Now, how do men come to terms with these unalterable facts? Well, Hume's liberal theory of society emerges when he shows how men hit upon conventional, but not arbitrary, conventional rules which prevent their natural passions damaging their long-term interests. But they're, of course, not arbitrary, these rules. He does speak of them as sometimes as being the product of reflection, but they aren't really the product of reason either. They are accidental. They come about through men exchanging and hitting upon certain ways of doing things. One example are the rules of commutative justice, described in the phrase stability of possessions, its transference by consent, and the keeping to promises. These provide for the unchanging facts of limited benevolence, and scarcity. In modern language, Hume's commutative justice are simply the rules of justice that allow people to exchange. It is not a theory of social justice which pinpoints some total desirable set of income and wealth arrangements. Now, uh, the rules of the commercial society are held to be superior in a utilitarian sense to other rules, for example, egalitarian rules, because, not because they are the product of some higher reason, but because they meet most effectively the fundamental feature of the human condition. Indeed, these rules also emerge through the operation of personal self-interest. The rules, property, right, and obligation, are determined uh, by individuals motivated by self-interest, but they have a dev an evident tendency to, mo to promote the public good. For Hume, therefore, liberalism is utilitarian. The rules of justice and property are not designed for protection of rights, for which reason can provide no grounding, but emerge naturally for the benefit of anonymous member society, member society taken at large. And Hume claims that though the rules of justice be artificial, they are not arbitrary, nor is the expression improper to call them laws of nature, if by natural we understand what is common to any species. Now, in fact, many people today of the non-libertarian persuasion regard Hume's rules of justice and Hume's, Hume's views of human nature as simply relative to 18th century Scotland. Uh, Alistair MacIntyre, a leftist philosopher, says exactly that. The interesting thing is that many liberal philosophers might very well say the same thing and say that there is no real foundation in morality for rights and therefore the claim that capitalism is of utilitarian advantage is merely provisional. It doesn't prevent uh, the possibility of some other system being used if it could be shown that that system itself had a, a better staring case. It doesn't, in fact, protect rights. Now, Adam Smith, uh, Hume, uh, Adam Smith, Hume's close friend, had a similar view of grounding liberalism on natural processes, but I think took the argument a little bit further and 
showed that there was some slightly more substantive founding for freedom than merely in the operation of a market and in the observation of the benefits of such markets. Uh, he had, in fact, a theory of ethics which was more favorable to a rights theory than was Hume's. Nevertheless, he starts off from a clear anti-rationalist position. He says in the theory of moral sentiments, it is altogether absurd and unintelligible to suppose that the first perceptions of right and wrong can be derived from reason. And he frequently uh, criticized the rationalist philosophers for attempting to rearrange the world according to some uh, neat and some uh, geometrically harmonious plan. Indeed, the division of labor on which Smith's utilitarianism depends was not a product of man's reason, but a gradual consequence of a certain propensity in human nature to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another. When uh, Smith talks about nature, his whole argument is suffused with the idea of natural liberty as the source of value. Men should be left perfectly free to pursue their own interests in their own way and bring their industry and capital in competition with those of any other men. Social systems are self-correcting mechanisms, and because they are self-correcting, if left alone, they are to that extent natural. Although most attention in the history of economic and political thought has been directed towards Smith's economic uh, arguments for natural processes, I want to talk a little bit more now about his explanation of ethical processes in basically natural terms. In Smith's morality, the pursuit of self-interest is not itself immoral. It is only immoral, in a, moral, in, in, in a sense, when self-love is uncorrected and unrestrained by other sorts of natural processes. We have a natural partiality to our interests, but this natural partiality is only harmful when it's uncorrected. Smith does, in fact, regard self-deceit as ultimately the fatal weakness of mankind, but this can be avoided if we allow for certain sorts of checking mechanisms. And liberalism, as a morality, depends upon these checking mechanisms to self-interest. The checking mechanism that uh, Smith talks about, first of all, is propriety, or the sense of rightfulness. Inborn in people is a sense of rightness. We know something's right or wrong when we can ally our decision of its rightness to certain natural uh, habitual judgments. Men, in fact, like to be well thought of. And because they like to be well thought of, they will adjust their selfish behavior in accordance with this desire to be well thought of. He talks frequently, therefore, of sympathy in the process of moral evaluation. Part of a moral judgment part of the process by which we eliminate self-interest is to sympathize, not in an altruistic sense with others, but in an understanding sense. We understand another person's point of view, and any moral system must depend upon a widespread notion of sympathy, or what we might today call empathy, an understanding that right and wrong depends upon not our, not our judgment alone, but upon our understanding of other people's judgments. In a similar way, he talks about the notion of an impartial spectator as being a checking mechanism. When we make a judgment, we have in our, in our minds the opinion that will be given by somebody unconnected with the particular argument or dispute, the particular disputed contract or promise. And this is the notion of an impartial spectator, which lies behind rules of justice, a further attempt to eliminate the pure notion of self-interest, a, a view really of detached opinion. Uh, furthermore, the further uh, checking mechanism is what Adam Smith calls uh, the voice within, or conscience. That when we make judgments about issues, we are ultimately uh, guided by a certain kind of inner conscience, which is natural to all men. And he argues that the principles of justice are imprinted on the human personality. They are not the conclusions of our reason. But also, we know what these things are, in advance of their utilitarian advantages. Unlike Hume, he saw, who saw that justice was merely shown to be beneficial, Smith sees that we all have implanted in us some notion of uh, just rules. Now, spontaneous social process, therefore, does produce 
moral harmony just as much as it produces economic harmony. We are more familiar, of course, with Smith on economic harmony than we are with him on moral harmony. I'll briefly mention uh, Smith's view of a natural economic harmonious, pro harmonious process. In a utilitarian sense, the system of natural liberty leads to better outcomes than a planned system. The efficient order of the market is brought about naturally through the interaction of the participants in their endeavours to better themselves. Any intervention is in fact self-defeating. No regulation of commerce can increase the quantity of industry in any part of society beyond what its capital can maintain. It can only divert a part of it into a direction which it might otherwise not have gone. It's a very famous Smith quotation. And indeed, such an harmonious order can function with the minimum of morality. In fact, the rules of just conduct imposing negative obligations is all that the commercial society requires. It merely, requires. it merely requires those rules to be enforced. All other uh, moral values, like, like such a benevolence, are in fact entirely self-generating. Now, in this natural process, there seems to be little about individual rights, which is a, a dominant feature of uh, post-Hume, post-Smith liberal philosophy. Or indeed, any view other than economic freedom benefits anonymous members of the public. Now, these considerations are thought to render Smith's argument entirely utilitarian. His naturalism relates not so much to persons, but to the processes which economic systems of free enterprise uh, bring about. However, I think Smith goes a little bit further than Hume in reconstructing a basic moral philosophy for all libertarians. Could not the notion of propriety and the role of the spectator constitute more substantive uh, ethical principles? Uh, I think, in fact, that this is so. For example, although in the wealth of nations, apprenticeship laws, laws uh, limiting movement of labor, although apprenticeship laws are refuted on utilitarian or efficiency grounds because they distort price signals in the labor market, they're also condemned by Smith as a, quote, manifest encroachment upon the just liberty of both the workman and of those who might be disposed to employ him. In other words, it's not just that they lead to misallocations, but they, in a sense, violate the personalities of individuals who should otherwise be allowed to simply express their natural liberties. The problem, however, is that in Smith, the rules of natural justice and even the sacred rights of man, which he occasionally talks about, may very well be relativistic things, particularly to the 18th century and not having any foundation in any universal concept of man. They might be thought to be the, an early version of the views of the man on the Clapham Omnibus, a familiar figure to English legal theory, rather than expressing the immutable standards of right and wrong. Uh, in Smith's own uh, legal theory, uh, he does regard law itself as a product of natural processes, if not quite in a natural law sense. He regarded it as being natural, mainly in contrast to the positivist tradition of law. In the positive tradition of law, law is seen to be the command of a sovereign. All law is seen to be designed by some omniscient supermind. Smith, in anticipating much of Hayek's work, has shown that a legal process embodies much more wisdom than a statutory process, and the common law system itself will better harmonize men's interests than could an omniscient a statute uh, system. So in that sense, Smith certainly has a view of nature which helps us understand the basic elements of a market society and goes a little bit further in saying how we can speak of certain uh, universally true features of the human condition which might be used, although not by Smith, which might be used to found a natural rights doctrine. Now, why do people these days think that the Hume-Smith view of natural processes is somewhat inadequate to found a proper doctrine of classical liberalism? I think there are a number of objections to this uh, spontaneous process view that libertarians especially, and indeed some classical liberals, have always made. The first and obvious objection is that the whittling down of the role of reason, and we should note that both Hume and Smith are at one in whittling down the role of, human, uh, of reason, 
could lead to the disintegration of liberalism into traditionalism, conservatism, and simply accepting that which has occurred as being right merely because it has occurred. In fact, this charge could be leveled at the foremost contemporary exponent of the Smithian approach, that's F.A. von Hayek. Von Hayek's later work, The Doctrine of Spontaneity, has become a kind of neo-Darwinian theory of cultural evolution in which the mere survival of an institution appears to guarantee its appropriateness. The limitations of reason dictate that, quote, all progress must be based on tradition. Furthermore, in Hayek's view, all rules and moral principles are relative to particular stages of evolution and our capacity to alter them is really limited by the fact that we can never know the consequences of such alteration. In fact, Hayek goes further than Hume down the conservative path because at least in the latter's persistent scepticism, this will preclude even rules that have survived. On Hume's limited view of reason, even rules that have survived would have no particular case to be any more than prejudice, any more than uh, more orthodox natural law situations. I mean, Hume is completely sceptical about all our uh, moral rules and values. That's the conservative objection to the spontaneous, spontaneous uh, order approach to liberal theory. Uh, the second objection is that this form of utilitarianism leaves open to doubt claims to property. Since, as a matter of logic, an exchange process must begin with objects that are themselves not the product of exchange, some moral grounding for entitlement is required. Clearly, a utilitarian demonstration of the benefits of exchange is inadequate. Hume has a complex theory of entitlement to property, but ultimately it has a marked bias towards present possession. Irrespective of how you possess your mansion, there's an a priori claim to have it your mansion uh, given to you because you are, in fact, in present possession, even though your great-great-great-grandfather might have stolen it from somebody else. This comes merely from Hume's cautious scepticism about any kind of change. This, of course, would preclude the contemporary Lockean view of entitlement to property, which does locate property claims not merely in present possession, but in terms of there being some moral right to that possession, use of labor, inheritance, gifts, market exchange, and so on. Now, the third objection to this utilitarian version of liberalism is based upon the idea that its rather uh, workaday empirical conception of man may itself be destructive of the liberal order. If we think of man as he simply is, selfish, partial, and so on, rather than man as he might be, then this might undermine the institute of a free society. This is because the economic and political advantages of a free society have public good characteristics. The benefits of the market system, free international trade, private property, and the rule of law accrue to the, on, to the anonymous members of the, of the public at large. And it therefore does not pay one person or group to actually promote them. It in fact pays uh, persons and groups to evade the implications of them. If you are in receipt of some government privilege, then according to the human conception of nature, you can't be blamed for hanging on to that government privilege, even though the proliferation of such government privileges, as we know in Britain, ultimately leads to the collapse of the free society. So the problem is, with the empirical conception of man as he is, and with a liberal order being something like a public good, then it seems to be difficult to persuade people to actually act for that system, which would undoubtedly uh, benefit them all in the long run. This problem, I think, entirely follows from the minimalist concept of man, which the orthodox classical liberal tradition stresses. Now, in, these, in light of these considerations, I want to look at the other views of naturalism in liberal theory, and these other views of naturalism have a clear uh, rationalistic uh, foundation. Unfortunately, they are not so clearly set out as the Hume, Smith, Hayek views are, I'm going to have to hunt around in the history of thought to find a more rationalistic, natural liberalism. Uh, as I said earlier, the rationalistic philosophical arguments are either in totally determined rights, though, which we have rights, or they are some kind of neo-Aristotelian naturalistic theory. Uh, 
both, of course, would fall foul of Hume's strictures. Um, Hume would say that, was, that, that no arguments can be produced to show we have such rights, and also that no facts of human nature can be used to, from which we can derive uh, evaluative or moral uh, judgments. Now, I look first, nevertheless, despite Hume's strictures, at the, the natural rights Lockean type rationalist liberalism, and then I'll look a little bit later at the uh, Aristotelian view. Now, the natural rights and natural law tradition is normally associated with Locke, but it is possible to suggest that the foundations were laid by Grotius, a great uh, international lawyer of the 17th century. Now, Grotius was a Christian, but nevertheless presented an essentially secular and rational theory of natural law. And although he wrote principally about international law, his theory has direct application to social philosophy and indeed to liberal philosophy. All rational beings are capable of discerning the elements of law. Law, not in a positive sense, but law in the sense of a body of internationally appropriate rules of conduct. Among the things that rational beings can discern with their reason the binding, the, uh, are the binding nature of promises, the non-aggression principle, and a fairly strong right to liberty. Interestingly enough, in an early work, Maria Liberum, uh, Grotius attempted to demonstrate that no state could legitimately own the sea. Natural law decreed that individualistic competition should prevail in the oceans. Part of his argument was that universal rules of natural law would in fact guarantee the right of individual appropriation of the sea, in the sea, and states should be forbidden from preventing individuals themselves uh, taking the benefits of the sea. Now, the philosophically cynical point here is that the principles of law which he described were firmly implanted in human nature and superior, morally, to any positive law. And they were not the rules of 17th century or 18th century society. They were not the particular values that had grown up, but were a product of man's ability, by the use of his reason, to directly perceive appropriate rules of, con of, of conduct. In fact, they were not the accidental outcomes of self-interested action, what I've called the third world phenomena in Smith, Hume, and Hayek, the rationale of which lies in a certain kind of experience, but these rules really rely upon no experience at all, but merely upon the ability of individuals to determine, re by the use of their reason, rules of just conduct. And this, of course, is a potential evolutionary doctrine. The Hume, Smith, Hayek liberalism is, in a sense, unrevolutionary because the bulk of its arguments rest upon experience, the growth of knowledge, spontaneous order. And because of the limits of our human reason, we must be very careful in altering the flow of spontaneous orders. We should be careful about any kind of reform because our limited knowledge prevents us predicting in advance what the consequences of that kind of reform will be. Now, the origins of what I would now call a revolutionary classical liberalism lie therefore just in those rationalistic natural law doctrines of which Hume and Smith were so scathing. For the idea that reason can determine law poses a threat to all existing legal systems. This notion, this potentially revolutionary notion, was given a specifically individualistic twist with the Lockean idea of self-ownership. Quote, every man has a property in his own person. This no body has any right to but himself. The labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. This has been taken by later radical libertarians as a definitive and indefeasible objection to all forms of interventionism. Since these necessitate the direction of the actions of one person by another who cannot be his natural owner, because we ourselves are natural owners. Such an objection is held to hold irrespective of any collective welfare or utilitarian advantage that may accrue from intervention. 
However, irrespective of the conceptual difficulty surrounding self-ownership, it is not clear in a substantive sense that it is sufficient to generate a liberal society. The strong sense of a right in the sense of ownership from Grotius through to Locke lies surely at the heart of the Hobbesian structure of an authoritarian society. Because what I may own, I may freely contract away. And Hobbesian men freely contract away that which they own and construct, therefore, unwittingly, if you like, an authoritarian society. Indeed, does not this strong sense of ownership legitimize slave contracts? If these are invalid because one cannot alienate the person, then does it not follow from this that one does not fully own the person? What is implicit in the Lockean and all natural law classical liberal positions is the concept of an equal liberty, that the only moral justification of the limitation of a person's liberty lies in the existence of a like freedom of action of others. Thus, only a strictly limited government is possible because only then would this freedom of action for everybody uh, not be violated. The notion, therefore, of welfare rights must be illegitimate because this involves the forced redistribution of income from rich to poor, which violates the equal rights of the rich. However, this desirable constraint morality of liberalism is surely only one of the possibilities that may emerge from the concept of natural man as a natural owner. The Hobbesian one is surely logically possible. Nevertheless, we must look on, derive the, nat the idea of property from the right to self-ownership because the idea of property is fundamental to, to, to all forms of liberalism. Again, to quote Locke, what a person removes out of the state that nature has provided and left in, he hath mixed his labor with and joined to it something that is his own and thereby makes it his property. Thus property precedes law, and of course the right to property holds independently of contract. As the late 19th century French laissez-faire economist Bastiat put it, life, liberty and property do not exist because men have made laws. On the contrary, it was the fact that life, liberty and property existed beforehand that caused men to make laws in the first place. A similar view, of course, is held by contemporary uh, libertarian theorists such as uh, Rothbard and, and so on. Uh, note here that Bastiat combined rather nicely a straightforward utilitarian uh, economics with uh, a natural law rationalistic theory of personal liberty. Now, what would people like Hume and Smith say of all this? It is not easy to substantiate the claim that mixing one's labor with a previously unowned object should establish a right to it. Uh, Hume argued that there are several kinds of occupation where we cannot be said to join our labor to the object which we acquire, as when we possess a meadow by grazing our cattle on it. If we fence in a piece of land, do we own the land that exists just below the uh, area of the fence, like a square inch, or do we own all the land which the fence encloses? It seems to me that the uh, right to property argument as expressed through self-ownership and first possession is ambiguous on these points. Because of this doubt about the viability of such natural law claims, people like Hume would dismiss such uh, appeals and their arguments are ultimately conservative. The rules of property cannot be determined by an unaided reason and their authority is established by a different appeal, the appeal to the sympathy and the imagination. People tend to approve of private property and the rules that back it up on the grounds of its general utility, not on the grounds of some fundamental right. The utilitarian, Humean, Hayekian classical liberals simply do not regard questions of original entitlement as important, at least not in comparison to the question of the overall stability of the property system. In fact, the natural law and natural rights locking liberals are more consistently individualistic since they are more concerned with the question of who owns what than with a slightly different issue of determining those systems of rules from which anonymous persons may benefit. This latter is still a utilitarian proposition, despite the prohibitions on interpersonal comparison of utility which its utterers place. Nevertheless, I think it's true 
that nature does not provide an, unambig an unambiguous or convincing theory of property entitlement. And the idea that there can be legitimate property independently of the law, as Bastiat and Locke thought there could, seems to me to be only plausible if you take law to be statute law or positive law. Uh, it seems to me that the notion of property without the notion of law is uh, confused and ambiguous. As long as you conceive of there being natural legal processes, i.e. laws that exist independently of states and sovereigns, then law and property uh, do indeed uh, go together. Now, the empirical, common-sense notion of man as he is has proved to be an extremely serviceable one in the history of liberal thought. As well as being highly appropriate to economics, it is itself an economical concept that makes few demands on our philosophical resources. However, as I suggested earlier, not only is the concept of selfish man inappropriate for, the communi for, for, for communist idealists, but also, paradoxically, it may be destructive of the selfish or liberal order itself. This is the public good point. Selfish men, uh, as Hume describes them, propensity to not to see their long-term interests. Uh, in Smith's argument uh, for morality, uh, doubts are clearly expressed about the viability of the selfishness. And there is more than a suggestion of Aristotelianism. Indeed, the full moral development of the person for Smith requires that the narrow confines of mere economizing be transcended. Smith's frequent allusions to the notion of self-command as an ethical aim and his constant denunciations of self-deceit suggest a moral idealism that contrasts sharply with the customary soulless calculation of orthodox classical economics. In other words, Smith himself felt that there has to be some other more expanded concept of, of, of natural man if we are to, in fact, bring about a free society. However, we have to turn to more recent exponents of classical liberal philosophy to find a fully developed Aristotelianism being used to underpin uh, market economics and to justify the fundamental features of possessive individualism. I will take simply one example and deal with this very briefly. One important example of the attempt to build a structure of man that transcends economizing is in the work of Ayn Rand. Now, in Ayn Rand's novels and essays, he produces no, if you like, systematic philosophy in the conventional academic sense, but there are clearly are implications of a strong kind of a fully-fledged philosophy of man. I want to contrast that with the orthodox classical liberal approach. In Ayn Rand's philosophy, there was a strident rejection of the Humean anti-rationalist defense of the market. She isn't interested in exploring the implication of a spontaneous process and seeing its accidental but unperceived advantages. Quote, the moral justification of capitalism lies in the fact that it is the only system consonant with man's rational nature, that it protects man's survival qua man, and that its ruling principle is justice. This is no gaunt and fleshless deontology, since the virtue of capitalism lies precisely in the fact that it fulfills man's natural purpose. It's not a side constraints doctrine like Nozick is. Nozick says nothing really about man except what you may not do to him. Rain, Rand bases her philosophy on a naturalistic view of man. That moral purpose, the moral purpose that natural man has, is egoism. Thus, it is not that descriptively man is selfish. Indeed, indeed, Rand regrets that this is not in fact the case. He just wishes people were more selfish. It is not descriptively that man is selfish, but that in her view he ought to be. Thus, selfishness is not merely a means to an end, as in Smith's famous observation that, quote, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interests, but for, for, for Rand, it is the rational end for man itself. Smith's justification for self-interest was that it benefited people, not that it made you a better person. For Rand, the starting point is self-interest is consonant with man's true nature. What saved this doctrine from a collapse into nihilism, when anybody literally doing whatever they like, what saves it from a collapse into nihilism 
is the absolutely binding nature of rights and their universalizability. They're not restricted time and place. They are constant features of the human condition. Thus, selfishness is not doing anything, but rather true selfishness is recognizing the rights of others to be selfish themselves. Now, how can one appeal to selfishness for the solution to the liberal dilemma posed above, when surely it is that selfishness that caused the difficulty in the first place? I said the difficulty was that the uh, Smithian man as he is view, echoed by Hume and Hayek, has difficulty that leads to a public good problem. No one, given that view of man, is going to act for a liberal society. Well, how can Rand solve that problem when she, in fact, praises the virtue of selfishness? Well, it is not mere selfishness to which Rand appeals, but an elevated form of egoism which condemns living off government and one fellow citizens as a perversion of man's true nature. So it's like a kind of moralized view of nature. Human nature is, is, is selfish, but true selfishness recognizes the rights of others to be selfish, and that indeed precludes the living off their income, living off the government, and all the other features of interventionist such a society. From this, it is easy to see indeed how a liberal regime might very well be imposed by force. If there is an objective morality capable of being read off from man's nature, then this would surely sanction the removal of all existing social and economic impediments to the full flowering of that nature. This contrasts sharply with the conservative utilitarian tradition of classical liberalism, from Hume to Hayek, which proclaims the inability of an act of reason to discriminate so clearly between different possibilities of social and economic organization. We can't abolish them all overnight, all our inefficiencies, interventions. We can't abolish them all overnight because we cannot know the consequences of such abolition. Also, we have no philosophical justification for saying that the natural law foundation of such abolition has any appeal to our intellects. Indeed, the use of the concept of nature could not be more different. In utilitarian liberalism, rational economic institutions emerge accidentally from the actions of individuals possessing little moral equipment. In the Aristotelian version, they appear to be a direct product of virtuous men. In the Smith-Hume-Hayek tradition, it is not businessmen that are virtuous. Smith himself, as we all know, stresses constantly the fact that if you get too much together, they will combine to rig prices. It is not their virtues that brings about the natural, spontaneous, harmonizing market. It is the accidental outcome of their basic uh, empirical natures. And it is the rules and institutions that have grown accidentally to protect individuals that have natural value. In the Randian view of the world, it would appear to be the case that the institutions of a liberal economic society come directly from men's virtues. Admittedly, they ought to be selfish, but in her view, since substance is a virtue, then virtue, the deliberate uh, pro um, propagation of virtue, if you like, undermines, uh, underlays her idea of a liberal order. From that, of course, it follows, an ex therefore, an extreme rationalistic approach to the structure of government, the idea that can sit down and use our reasons to determine the appropriate economic and social institutions. Again, this contrasts with the specifically anti-rational approach of the hume Hayek tradition, which, because it faith places so little faith in reason, trusts to spontaneous processes. Now, I do not say the Aristotelian version of liberalism is correct, or that all liberal intellectual resources should be invested in encouraging its development from what is, at the moment, an embryonic state. I don't think either that we should discard that minimalist concept of man that has proved to be so fruitful in the development of classical liberal thought. It's important, however, to appreciate the crucial importance of the concept of nature in the variety and complexity of liberal thought, and to understand how different are the foundations of classical liberalism, no matter how similar may be our particular uh, policy views. If we are to have a coherent and well-thought-out um, 
the doctrine of liberalism, we must decide whether we want to trust to natural processes in the social sense of spontaneity and hope that they will not, our arguments will not disintegrate into a kind of traditionalism or conservatism. And it, they may do that because of the limited use that reason has. But trust me in that view, or the heavily rationalistic view which sees certain immutable features of the human condition which it uses to found liberal institutions. But if you take that view, we have the problem of not persuading people that reason can discern so clearly such rules, institutions, and also the problem of in incorporating those into a social program which doesn't wipe away all that is developed naturally in the vague illusion that, or vague illusion, that something better may come out of the process. So I will